Some of my peers from the dorms would say they grew up in an orphanage. However, I never did. If asked, I always said I grew up at the library among the stacks of rarely touched books and hollow discs. Raj, the old man who was tasked with caring for me and a half dozen others from the dorms, had little time or concern for us and preferred to spend his efforts researching legal cases and historical documents at one of the regional libraries in Queensland, the planetary capital of Bean Lee in Capellan controlled space. It was his passion for reading that set me on my journey. Of course, as a child, I had little knowledge or understanding of interstellar politics. All I cared about was finding a new book to read, carrying a stack back to the dorm to read during dinner and late into the night under the dim hallway light as others slept in their rooms. My ravenous hunger for the written word knew no boundaries. I read fantasy stories, biographies, history books, cookbooks, and even a manual on the maintenance and repair of battle mech actuators that looked like it had been used by a technician who never bothered to wash the grease from his or her hands. Occasionally, my blissful reading would be interrupted with shouts of, Sydney, out of the way! Or Sydney, put that book down and clean up, you lazy girl! It was all that much background noise. The years passed by rather uneventfully, and on my 16th birthday, I faced the prospect of what to do now that I was aging out of the care system. I had done a lot of thinking and decided that I wanted to go on to one of the advanced academies to continue my education, but quickly ran into issues as there seemed to be a lot of requirements that I just couldn't meet. Having connections, particularly family connections, was a crucial step in the process, and since I never knew who my parents were, that was a no-go. Even the technical academies rejected my applications because my grades in primary school were not very impressive due to the fact that I was always reading non-related books in class. Eventually, the director of the orphanage stepped in and sent me to the Queensland Guard recruiting office where a helpful soldier with a smile like a barracuda signed me up for military service with the promise that it would help me get into an academy after my term of service was finished. It was all rather suspicious, but by that point I was out of options other than living in the streets where I doubted I could have much time for reading. Of course, the joke was on me as I rarely touched a book over the next 10 weeks of training. As someone who was rather short and built for the lightest of chores, the training was brutal. Much of my time was spent falling off of climbing obstacles into the dirt, water, or mud when the two were mixed together in the planet's rainstorms. Being shorter, weaker, and less athletically inclined left me a tired mess. The one part of the training in which I did excel was in the old warehouse that served double duty as a classroom. Memorizing rules, procedures, and tactical doctrines came easy, and I even tried to help a few of my fellow recruits who were mostly appreciative of the effort. To be fair to our commanding officer, I was a marginally more capable mess by the end of my rigorous training. In our final week, our squad of 24 received word that we'd be joining the Harlock Raiders, a Legion military unit stationed on the planet. These orders were unusual as the whole base seemed to be on edge and things were being rushed. Usually recruits that had just finished their training were given a few days of R&R, &R, but just hours after a Spartan graduation ceremony, I was sitting in the back of a truck, geared up, with all my worldly possessions stuffed into a rucksack back at the barracks promised to be sent soon. I pushed the dark green rimmed glasses up on my nose and looked down the streets of the city as the truck quickly moved along with many others to an unknown destination. We arrived at what could best be described as a chaotic mess of a forward operating base. Clearly something big was going on as everyone seemed to be moving with haste. Armored vehicles of all makes and models were being worked on, loaded, and marked with a spray painted green lion on a red diamond background. Jumping out of a truck, I stumble, but I'm caught by a comrade who goes by the name of Flynn. I knew his name, but very little else about him, as I didn't really do much socializing during training. It was a skill that I never picked up from reading all those books. We were hurriedly sent to the large hangar where hundreds of other soldiers were already waiting, and I couldn't see anything from behind the taller soldiers in front of me. I tried to listen as best I could, but I could only make out short sentence fragments and the occasional word. Thirteen hours. Davion. Delay and harass. Fortune Baker. None of these words sounded good. Looking around, it started to dawn on me that this wasn't a training operation that we were joining. This was something much bigger and much more dangerous. In a flash, I was reminded of that recruiting officer, soldier with that barracuda smile. Suddenly, it all made a lot more sense. Soldiers around me began to murmur, make comments about needing more info, or wanting to know what we were facing. 
The briefing was cut, and orders to move out were shouted. I followed those around me out of the building and into the hastily set up queue for firearms. When I stepped to the front of the line, a gruff looking fellow holding a clipboard gave me the up and down gaze and tapped the tablet in his hand. The clerk sighed next to him and handed me a rifle and I was shuffled along. I met up with my unit and we met our new Lance Sergeant. His uniform looked different than ours, still a forest green but with a slightly different tone due to exposure to the elements. The green lion on his shoulders told us that he was with the Harlock Raiders and not the local military. He pulled the 24 of us to a relatively quiet portion of the Farrakrete tarmac and said, Welcome to the Raiders. I wish we could have met in calmer circumstances, but war waits for no one. We're in the thick of it here as it seems the full weight of House Stavion is bearing down on us. We can't win, but we sure as hell are going to cause as much damage as possible on our way out. You're going to help, and we're going to make it out of here in one piece, you get me? Yes, sir, came a chorus of somewhat nervous recruits. An hour later, we were on yet another truck driving up a dilapidated road in the forested hills west of Queensland. Over the noise of the truck, the Lance Sergeant outlined that we were going to be the hammer on the anvil of a strike on an advancing mercenary scouting force. It was all vaguely terrifying as I clung to my rifle like a security blanket. Eventually, the truck slid to a stop along the side of a forested hillside and we were sent up into the hills. The prospect of actually firing this rifle at another human being filled me with dread. This was all supposed to be a way to get into an academy, and now, here I was, marching up a hill on my way to defend the city from some mercenaries. We reached the crest of the hill, which, between the large trees, offered a view of a rather beautiful lake in the distance. Below there was a highway, presumably the one we traveled on to get here. I pushed up my glasses and appreciated the clear and seemingly clean water as the sun set behind us. Further to the east, lights and sounds from a military installation were obvious. It didn't look like the one we came from, but at this distance I couldn't be sure. In the west, the road followed the edge of the lake, then snaked south. Told to dig in for the moment, our sergeant told us that we were going to sit and wait for the mercenaries to come up the road and attack the base. What I didn't know at the time was that the base was a fake. Sure, there were work lights, tents, and even vehicles in view from a distance, but the place was largely deserted. Only a handful of soldiers walked around, busied themselves, and moved equipment to make it look like a functioning site. As I mentioned, I didn't know that at the time. Neither did the mixed infantry and light battle mech scouting unit of the future Baker mercenaries slowly rumbling into view on the two-way street to the west. It was clear that our little unit was only a small piece of an intricate plan as word traveled on the comms to shut up and stay down until told otherwise. On the signal, we were to move down the hill quickly and assault the column. It all seemed so simple. Go down the hill and attack the enemy. I squeezed the rifle in my hands as I sat against the base of a thick tree trunk and tried to imagine myself in any other place. I thought of the bookshelves at the library, full of all those wonderful dusty books, and desired nothing more than to read the ones that hadn't been touched in decades or even hundreds of years. I thought about the books of romantic poetry, the history books with ancient generals and battles, and most powerfully of all, I recalled the fantasy tales of knights on horseback, without a rifle or battle mech in existence. The moment was interrupted by the sergeant's voice on the calm lake. Go! I took a deep breath and started to stand up, only to be knocked back onto my butt by the cacophony of destruction being opened from the hillside. Recoilless rifles fired, portable PPCs cracked with artificial thunder and lightning, and missiles shrieked down the hillside towards the convoy of vehicles, and mechs traveling quickly along the roadway toward the base they hoped to overrun. Missiles and autocannon rounds smashed into the front and rear vehicles and lit up the early evening sky. A Jenner turned to face the litany of attackers on the hillside only to crumble as a series of PPC bolts evaporated the armor and then the internal structure of its left knee in seconds. I saw all this, still sitting on the hillside, in complete shock as I became a witness to war's brutal, unfair reality. This wasn't two equal sides meeting politely on the field of battle. This was thousands of Carthaginians running down the hill screaming while their targets struggled to respond. Finally, regaining a sense of control, I crawled to my feet and started making my way down the hillside through the underbrush and between the trees. I was a good 20 meters behind my unit at this point and still had a panoramic view of the carnage below. Every time I looked down, I saw fresh misery being poured out onto the soldiers below. Vehicles pushed at the burning wreckage in front of them in an attempt to break out of the ambush, only to be targeted themselves in becoming a fresh roadblock. 
I looked to the west and saw several dark green battlenecks marching up the road from behind the column, starting to spray it with lasers and autocannon fire. I saw another mercenary mech, a blue and white humanoid design, decide to turn and break from the column. It chose the best course of action was to wade out into the lake, seeking shelter under the water. Soldiers from the column followed suit, many quickly falling under the water, weighed down by gears and firearms, not to return. As I approached the road, snaps of rounds passing by scared me to the point that I fell down behind a fallen and partially burnt tree trunk. I lifted my rifle but was shaking so much that when I pulled the trigger, the shot was wild and horribly inaccurate. It didn't matter. I was only adding a tiny bit to the waves of fire. Within the first minute, every vehicle in the column was on fire or blown to smoking wreckage. The mech that tried to head into the lake now stood waist-deep with its torso bent forward motionless. The edges of the large hole in its lower back still glowed orange from the PPC shot to the mech's spine. Staring at the mech in the water, I was reminded of something I had read long ago but couldn't put my finger on it. I continued to fire my rifle but never really aimed at anything or anyone. The other Harlock raiders around us cleared out the last of the infantry holdouts among the vehicles and the shores of the lake. I didn't see anyone surrender, nor anyone offer it. Eventually, I got up and joined my unit. They looked tired and shell-shocked, but had no time to recover as we were told to quickly head back up the hill. The sergeant said we didn't want to be here when the reinforcements showed up. That was a claim that no one challenged. Near the top of the hill, I looked back at the road below and wondered if anyone would record what happened. When we finally had a chance to rest, many hours later, I wrote all of this down in my journal. Maybe if I survive this, my account can show up in a book in the library. Thanks as always for watching. I know these short stories don't get a ton of play on YouTube, but my creativity is a bit like a cat in a Christmas tree. I have no idea how I got here, but I'm having the time of my life. Thanks to the Ko-Fi supporters for the continuing support. I appreciate you. If you are looking for more, check out the fun video discussing why we love Goss rifles up on the screen above. Take care, be awesome, go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.